Well, good afternoon. Today is April the 12th, 2020. Today is also Resurrection Sunday. And this is the day that uh, even on the Hebrew calendar is referred to as the Feast of First Fruits. Uh, that is spoken of in Leviticus chapter 23 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 where Paul the Apostle writes that now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So that's an important clue to point out the fact that Jesus did indeed rise on first fruits, which was the uh, uh, holy day, the feast day that occurs after the weekly Sabbath, the same week that Passover occurs. Anyway, it is my prayer that everyone that is watching this video has taken or will take time out to worship the Lord in the spirit and in truth. As we have been finding out over the last two, three, four weeks or so, the rights of Americans to assemble and worship have been compromised, if not tossed out altogether. But we'll get into that in just a moment, because today's video is titled, Return to the Word of God, Darkness, Coronavirus, and Right to Assemble Denied. For many videos now, we've been covering the matter of darkness. Darkness that has come across the world in general, and the United States in particular. This is not a very good country to be in right now if you want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth because the rights to do so are being taken away. We have the coronavirus out there, which is right now at the present time uh, starting to show some signs of cresting, or at least the elevated levels we've seen of, of uh, uh, <coughs> people that have been infected and also people that have died appear to be leveling off. But before we get into the news too seriously and into the matters of the coronavirus and what it is doing to the rights of the United States, let's consider the Word of God first and foremost. I ask you to open your Bible and turn again to John chapter 3, verse 17. John chapter 3, verse 17. Uh, we have continued to read this week after week after week, and I'm not about to stop because there are important verses in here that almost nobody reads in their scriptures or has sermons quoted from. So let's go ahead and read John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. If you think that's bad, i got an even worse verse for you, more bad news in John chapter 3, verse 36, containing some ominous words from John the Baptist. We read these words from verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And let's transition into the matter of what is called the wrath of God. Again, open your verses, or excuse me, your Bibles to the following verses in Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. Romans 1, beginning with verse 18. For the wrath, that's right, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 20, 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That, of course, is verse 22. So we professed ourselves to become wise and became fools, and in the world of darkness, the fools really came out of the woodwork, and we've really seen them come out. By the way, I do not at this time blame the President of the United States for what has happened to the United States regarding the, the, uh, the closers, uh, the shutdowns, the lockups, whatever you want to call it, of what's been going on in this country. I do believe he is putting forth a conscious, directed, purposeful effort to get this nation back on its feet. However, he has great opposition from people within, well, let's put it, the far left community in America who want to see this nation destroyed. All right, let's consider again. We're in the time of what we call, what, Jacob's trouble? No, no, that's Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 7 through 11. We are, however, in what's called the beginning of sorrows. This is what Jesus called it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 8. 
So in light of that, go ahead and open your Bibles once more to Luke chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. Luke 21, verses 10 and 11. We read these words. And he said unto them, that is Jesus, And he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights. And great signs shall there be from the heaven. Does that sound like the world we're living in right now? Here it is, Resurrection Day, and we're talking about fearful sights from the heaven. We're talking about famines and pestilences. We're talking about the beginning of sorrows. Some people have wondered throughout history, or throughout the church history anyway, especially in the last, let's say, 30 or 40 years, what does all this business mean about the beginning of sorrows? I'm doing pretty good. I got a lot of money in the bank account. I got a car I can drive everywhere I want to. I've got a grocery store just down the road I can go and pick up toilet paper if I wanted it. Well, now I'll go back about another 40 years into the future. Here we are now uh, going to a grocery store to look for toilet paper, and lo and behold, you find an empty shelf. What does it say in Romans chapter 1? It says, Neither were they thankful. We've been given an abundance of plenty in this country, and the only thing we can do is shake our fists in the face of God, and for those of us who should know better, we're not thankful as we ought to be. The coronavirus an event in America may have crested, as I mentioned previously, but we're not really sure yet, but I have a feeling that it has. So I think there's going to be a serious movement on the part of those who are concerned about saving the American economy without total destruction or from total destruction uh, before it's too late. And in fact, in statistical improvements are going underway. Guidelines are still in force, however. And what I mean by enforce is, remember, they were just guidelines but there has been a certain element of enforcement that has been thrown in to keep the guidelines going by politicians and by their law enforcement advocates, I guess you might say it, that are going along. Perhaps the most Orwellian of all of these restrictions, these guidelines, is the one that says that people meeting in public should not approach more, uh, less than six feet from one another. What does that mean? Well, what that means, if you want to go to church on Sunday, and today being Resurrection Day, you would think the churches will be filled to capacity. One of maybe two days out of the year, the churches are filled to capacity. The other one being Christmas. I won't go into that right now, but let's, let's, let's concentrate on Resurrection Day. And people will come in dressed very nicely, and they'll worship the Lord, hopefully in spirit and in truth, and that's fine. That's wonderful. That's the way it should be done. God expects us to assemble together in a church uh, congregation in a church setting. Again, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let's see if I can remember that one. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but rather exhorting one another, and all the more so, as you see the day approaching. What do we mean? What day are we talking about? The day of the Lord. We may see the beginning of the day of the Lord this year in the good old USA and in the rest of the world. If you happen to be living in a country right now where you can still worship the Lord in spirit and in truth in a congregational setting and not worry about six feet, blessed are ye today. Because you have not surrendered to the will of man over the will of God. Remember what, uh, didn't Peter say something back in the book of Acts? He says, we ought to obey God rather than men. After the scribes and the Pharisees had threatened them with imprisonment and beatings and all kinds of things. They, they were just wonderful people to be around, weren't they? Well, we got them in America today. And they certainly have them over land in China. Because in China, um, the Christians have much more restrictions placed on them than they do in the United States. But... Because we got the coronavirus from China. China is serving as a wonderful model to the rest of the world about how you can go ahead and get people locked up in their houses and restrict their movements in public settings. And we're moving that direction ever so quickly in the good old USA today as we go outside to look at all the people that are driving down the highway right now. Well, maybe not here so much in Arizona. People still can't stay uh, out of their cars very long. They have to go somewhere, otherwise they're going to go stir-crazy or whatever. But in other parts of the country, New York City, Los Angeles, it's almost a ghost town, the way people are being uh, sequestered in their homes and kept away from public settings and events. We don't have sporting events in this country. Well, big loss, right? I think what's really bad is you can't worship God the way we used to. You can worship Him in spirit and in truth anywhere. You can sit in front of a uh, in a room like this, uh, open your Bible and read the Word of God and study the Word of God and pray to the Lord and worship Him in spirit and truth. That didn't go away. But I, was, I can assure you that the powers that be and that the authorities that are out there running this nation would only love to get electronically into your house so they can see if you're worshiping in spirit and in truth so that they can come to the door and knock on it and say, you're coming with us. 
Anyway, I'm getting off the track here a little bit. I have three verses to, to, uh, to read you in, uh, in light of this. I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 24 again, and let's read verse 12. Matthew 24, verse 12. We read these words. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I think that Jesus was speaking at a time beyond the, uh, the beginning of sorrows period that we're living in right now. He's talking about the Great Tribulation. But isn't it interesting that we're starting to see this right now, even before things have really gotten tough? We already saw it in, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 21, uh, verses 10 and 11, where great signs, fearful sights, men's hearts failing for fear. That's later on in that chapter. Yeah, the tougher times are coming. Because iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. Let's also consider Romans chapter 1, verse 31. We just came out of Romans chapter 1 just a moment ago. So I should be able to turn there real quickly and find those few verses. Romans 1, 31. Talking about the nature of fallen man pretty much any time you want to. We read, without, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, and you're seeing that happen right now, too. Not just without natural affection, but people that are becoming not only implacable, you can't, you can't placate them, you can't tell them the truth, they're going to accept it, but then they become unmerciful in the way they deal with you because you are a deplorable person, to quote Hillary Clinton, if you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. One more verse, if you would, please. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. 2 Timothy 3. Verse 3. Again, we're a lot of end time signs in that 2 Timothy uh, epistle, and we're reading a lot about them right now. We talked about a little bit of this last week, but again, let's continue with verse 3. And what do we read in first, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3? The first thing that is read is without natural affection. Isn't that something? Paul repeated it again. He said it in Romans 1 31. He says it again here in 2 Timothy 3, verse 3. Without natural affection. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Oh yeah, that's right, Hillary. Hold the phone, Hillary. You say that somebody like me that worships the Lord in spirit and in truth is a deplorable. Well, we just read all about Hillary here in this verse. Despisers of those that are good. Good. How good? Good in the sight of the Lord. Somebody that seeks the Lord daily in prayer, in Bible study, in reading the scripture, in, uh, in fellowship with other people, with other believers, and with those who maybe just might be trying to learn something from the Word of God that are, that are presently lost, but maybe they want to get saved. Like LGBTQ people, homosexuals, there are still those out there who do not subscribe to the political agenda of the LGBTQ community in America, and everywhere else, by the way. They are seeking God. They may be having trouble because of their lifestyle, but God will drag them out of the mire. What does it say in, in, in Jude chapter, uh, verse 23? It says, Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. There are people like that out there that are in the LGBT community who want to be saved. They maybe don't know how to do it. Maybe they do. But they're trying to seek the Lord with their heart. And they can get saved just as surely as any other person can on this planet that is not LGBT. Did I get that right? I'm very bad at alphabet soup. I'm sorry. I'm having trouble with that stuff here. Well, let's see. What else have I done today? What haven't I covered? Judgment has come to America. I guess we talked about that too. And it has. But this is not a judgment of vengeance. This is not a judgment of... Uh, what's the other word I'm looking for? Of wrath from God. It is simply something that is... Uh, best I can say, it is a stern warning that God from God that something heavier and harder hitting is about to occur. How is it about to occur? When's that going to happen? I don't know. Let's look at September 18th, Feast of Trumpets. What would happen if all of a sudden tens of millions, hundreds of millions, or a billion or more people suddenly disappeared? Well, you have a fulfillment right there of Second, uh, First Timothy chapter, or excuse me, First Thessalonians chapter five. Turn with me there, if you will, for a moment. First Thessalonians chapter five, beginning verse one. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety. Isn't that America today? Oh, we're going to keep everybody safe. Keep them locked up in their houses and don't get the virus. Oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> All right. Peace and safety. Then, hold the phone. Sudden destruction cometh upon them. 
as travail upon a woman with child, and they, that is the world that is lost, the world that has not come to Jesus in faith, they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, you all, you people are saved out there. Ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, the God is putting out a warning right now to let people know that they are that, that are that are in the know that that love Him, that worship Him, that study His Word, that they are not in darkness. And that day, that blessed hope that we're going to go home someday is going to come very quickly. Yes, but we're not going to be too terribly surprised. We'll be delighted. We'll be overjoyed. But we'll know that the day as is coming very very soon, and we're in the in the season of His return for his church. At this point in the video, of course, you know I'd like to say something about salvation. I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The manner of salvation is very simple. Jesus said so, and Paul said so. 